up here. You know how hard that is for a guy who does this for a living to have to sit through so many incredible presentations where the bar kept going higher and higher and then you come up and you're like, oh my God, what next? So I'm here. This picture on the screen right now, I posted that on Instagram two years ago and I got probably 200 comments asking the same question. Chris, is that you? I know you're a cyclist. Is that you? I waited a couple days and said, no, it's not me. <laughs> but I love the picture so much that I kept it in my repertoire, and it just shows up here. I call it the breakaway because it's what happens when you're on a bicycle, and the peloton is behind you, and you decide to step out and get ahead of them. That doesn't happen to me very often at this point in life, but I like to reminisce through the photograph. So that's me as a young kid. And that music that we were just dancing to, is the 18th album from Stevie Wonder. If some of you know Stevie Wonder, he's an amazing musician and singer and artist. And that song resonated with me. The words were, looking back on when I was a little nappy-headed boy and my only wish was for Christmas, what would be my toy? That was like my theme as a child. Growing up in Cleveland, Ohio, all I knew was what my parents had taught and told me, and life was really, really good. As a matter of fact, I fell in love with Stevie Wonder and the music that he played to the point where I went to my bedroom one day and I jumped on my laptop 1.0, it's a typewriter, and I wrote out the words to this song, and because I was, I, was, I was like so enthralled with them. And the next day, my mom came to my room, as she always does, and she started straightening things up, and she looked at the typewriter, and she called my dad, and she said, come, you got to look at this, you got to look at this. So they looked at the words on the paper, and they were like, oh my gosh, our son is a lyrical genius. <laughs> he's, like, he's, he, we're going we're gonna to get this published. This is incredible. So for two days, I kept quiet, because... I just like living in that place. And then finally I said, no, I'm a plagiarist, not a genius. And, and my parents, I think they were like upset that they didn't have a genius as a kid, but I was still just as happy with, with the recognition that I had at least known the words to this music that Stevie Wonder put out. I grew up in this little Midwest town called Cleveland. And where I grew up, if you know anything about the Midwest in this country, it's very, it's very segregated. There is the, 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 the black side of Cleveland, there is the, the, the Polish side, there's the Italian side, there's the Jewish side, but they all live in little separate parts. I lived in the black side of Cleveland, and my grade school looked something like this. All the kids were in the same neighborhood, we all played the same sports. We all liked each other. My biggest fan in life was mom. And as a matter of fact, she'd get in the kitchen and started cooking, and I would just go in there and serenade her with a couple Stevie Wonder songs so I could get first dibs on the food, whatever it was, because I had siblings. That was my way of getting to the front of the food line. I also uh, was pretty athletic at the time. I played basketball, I played football, I, uh, I ran with my friends. It was just fun growing up as a kid in Cleveland. 
Some of my favorite artists were on this label called Motown. If you know anything about Motown, it was the album, it was the, the label where a lot of uh, black artists would actually perform back when I was growing up. And I knew all the artists, I knew all the songs. Life was good. I was also part of a community, a church, uh, that was Catholic, and that's how I was raised. And I was an altar boy. I knew the mass in English and Latin. And my dad would sit in the back of the church every Sunday when I was on the altar and wait for me to fall asleep so he could then, you know, sh you know throw some eye signals up at the front to make sure that, oh, my God, there's my son falling asleep again. Let's make sure that he, he wakes up. Life was very darn good. As a matter of fact, I got categorized as gifted as a sixth or seventh grader. I was gifted because I did really good academically as well as athletically, and my teachers decided to skip me up a grade because I was, I was gifted. And being called gifted, I wasn't sure what it really was, but I was happy because I got a lot of attention, especially at school. I got so much attention that for, co for, for high school, coming out of grade school, I got sent to a different part of Cleveland. I got sent over to the west side of Cleveland. On the west side of Cleveland, very different than the east side, everything was palatial. I went to this high school that was called St. Ignatius of Loyola. It was an all-male Jesuit high school. I felt like it was the Harvard of high schools. I mean, the academics were really, really tough, and Ignatius was good at everything. 99.998% of every student from Ignatius went to college. So if you got into Ignatius, chances are you're going to get into a great college. And that was my mission, because I wanted to get out of this small little area where I had grown up. So I was at Ignatius, and I knew that was all she wrote. I'm going to make it to college. Ignatius also had a reputation for having some of the best athletics. They had an incredible football team. They had an incredible basketball team. They made it to state every year. And I loved being at least part of that. But then there was the shadow of Ignatius. If you look at this picture, you could all say, what looks different about this picture? <laughs> like, like nobody ever had to ask, Chris, where are you at in the yearbook? It was pretty obvious. <laughs> Ignatius was, and I did the calculation myself, Ignatius was 0.3% diverse. And had my brother not gone there also, it would have been 0.25% diverse. That's just the way things were. But I was so excited to be there. Everything about this school was a challenge for me. It was taught by priests. They were all white. They looked different than me. It was in a neighborhood which was very different than the neighborhood I had grown up in. It was all, it was all white. The neighborhood, the teachers, and the students, they were all foreign to me. As a matter of fact, my experience at Ignatius was so different because half the time I had to look up the names that I was being called. I could not understand what some of the names actually meant. How could it be an insult to call me anything that ended with the word bunny? So I would look it up to make sure that it was supposed to be an insult, and it was. So I learned a lot about myself by going through this school. The biggest damaging part of this experience, for me anyway, was the fact that even though I was at the school and doing the academics, my, my parents, who were from the east side, who had not gone to a prestigious school like this or college, they couldn't afford it. So Ignatius, in their kindness, offered me an opportunity to attend the school and pay for my own tuition. And so every day at 3 o'clock when my friends would go to the gym to pick up their basketballs or their shoes to play, I would go to the janitor's closet. I'd put on a set of overalls. I would grab a bucket and a mop, and I would do the floors all night in exchange for my tuition. I did not think that this was a damaging experience, but in hindsight, it affected the way I looked at and thought about myself. 
because I didn't feel like I was on the same platform as everyone else. I felt like I was at a different level in society based on these set of experiences. Well, I endured this for four years, and it was not easy. But it was something that I knew I had to get through in order to get to college. So right around my senior year at Ignatius, I go into my guidance counselor's office, and I'm excited because I'm thinking to myself, it's time. I'm finally going to be first-generation college. I'm not even sure what that really means other than the fact that with a college degree, there's going to be more opportunities for me in life. So I go into my college, my high school counselor's office, and I say, hey, listen, I'm thinking about a couple different colleges here, and I'm, I'm thinking also I'm going to need a little bit of uh, either scholarship or financial aid or something. The counselor looks at me, and he puts his head down. He looks back up at me again, and I'm thinking, oh, he's got some great ideas here. He goes, Chris, he goes, you know, college is not for everybody. He said, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not for everybody. I said, okay, I know that, but, you know, I, I worked really hard here, and I'd really like to at least be considered for a co-. He goes, listen, Chris, there's a couple trade schools that I think you would be fantastic at. Like, there's an auto mechanic trade school that's right down the street, and they're looking for incredible people like you. I said, but I don't know how to work on a car. <laughs> like, he goes, but you could learn. I said, couldn't I do that at college also? He goes, yeah, but it's, it's just not for everybody. At that point, I just decided I need to take this into my own hands because this is not going the way I thought it was going to go. So I found out about three universities where you could actually go, and it was a full scholarship, no more having to work. So I applied to all three. It was Annapolis, Annapolis, Maryland, Naval Academy, it was West Point, Military Academy, and it was Air Force, Air Force Academy. On April 15th of my senior year in high school, I got some of the best news I could ever get. I got an acceptance letter from the Air Force Academy. I wanted applause from you. Thank you. <laughs> I was excited about this experience of being accepted someplace where, my gosh, they're, they're creating leaders. They said, Chris, we need for you to show up on June 27th for BCT. I didn't know what BCT meant, but I later found out that's like that basic training stuff. But I was there. I was like, I'm going. So I jumped on a plane and off to Colorado Springs, Colorado. I arrived in Colorado Springs, Colorado at a little airport, which is about 30 minutes away from the academy. And we get off the airplane, it was a bunch of us, and we get onto these buses. And we get onto these buses, and the thing that I noticed when I was on the bus is that there were individuals from what seemed like every state in the country. There were people in bell bottoms and braids. There were also people in cowboy boots and stetsons. And I said, oh, my goodness, how is this going to work? Like, this is very different than Cleveland. People are sitting next to each other here. And I said, I don't know how this is going to go, but I'm part of it now. So let's just see what happens. Let's see what happens. So I'm on this bus, and we get to the bottom of this thing that's called the infamous Bring Me Men ramp, which has since time been changed because the academies all have women in there now. But at the base of this camp, you get off the bus, and there was a swarm of upperclassmen with berets, and they came at you. They were yelling things at you, and we were all standing there, 17, 18-year-old kids petrified. What's about to happen now? That was 9 o'clock in the morning. We, we walked up the ramp to where we all got indoctrinated to what this experience was going to be like in the military. By noon that day, we were all standing in formation. Nothing looked the same. Our heads were shaved. All of our I used to have hair that needed to be shaved. It, so imagine that just for a second. We were all in white T-shirts, green fatigues, and black boots. All those differences that appeared on the bus had pretty much vanished. I was excited to be at the academy. I was excited because this would be the first time since high school that I'd actually be able to do something besides 
sweep and mop floors. And so I went out for every team possible. I went out for the basketball team, and I actually walked on. I was the only person to make the basketball team as a walk-on. But after the first season, I said, I have watched enough basketball because I wasn't getting any play time. And I said, this is not for me. I also walked on for football. I made the football team also. But after the first day we got put in pads and I woke up from being basically knocked out, I said, this is, this is not for me either. I, like, I'm not, I don't want to do this. And then I found a sport where you didn't necessarily need a lot of pre-academy experience. <sighs> Boxing. Boxing. I spent the next three years in a boxing ring. Kind of ironic because it's really a square. But I spent three years <laughs> with this varsity sport, and I loved every second of it. I don't know why the Colorado Springs newspaper decided to air this picture on the very front page because that fight looks like it was competitive. I knocked this guy out in the second round. It was a technical knockout. But they still published this picture as though it was a really competitive fight. I enjoyed every second of being in competition. It also got rid of a lot of the anger that I was feeling still resonant from high school. Freshman year at the academy, I remember there was this one specific drill sergeant, the person that teaches you how to march and eat correctly. And he had this rock that was sitting on the, on the front of his desk. And it said, life, life is not fair. Life is not fair. He said, people are born with gifts and glitches, but it's not fair. Everyone is not going to end up in the same place in life. Be happy for your gifts, but do not necessarily worry and focus so much on the glitches, the things that you're not that great at, because we're all a little bit different. I was excited about this because there were a lot of glitches that I had in my life. But there were also a ton of gifts, things that I inherited from my gene pool, which I didn't really even deserve a lot of times. Four long years at the academy, and it was time for graduation. I had put in the work. All of the things that I had focused on as a freshman at the academy, which were a lot of differences between myself and some of the other people, they had kind of, by senior year, they had blurred. The differences had blurred, and the thing that united us was this collective mission of service, which I was excited to be part of. That mission of service just went over all of the differences, and that's what we focused on. It was what can we do collectively together, and that's the way we kind of navigated not only the academy, but also time in the military. I remember last year about this time sitting in the audience and I saw a, or I heard a poem that was read by Maya Angelou. And it reminded me of my personal journey and where I was at that time. So I want to take another listen to that poem. So just hang on for a second and let's dim the lights. There's an African American song, 19th century, which um, is so great. It says, when it looked like the sun wasn't gonna shine anymore, God put a rainbow in the clouds. Imagine, and I've had so many rainbows in my clouds. I had a lot of clouds, but I have had so many rainbows. And one of the things I do when I step up on a stage, when I stand up to translate, when I go to teach my classes, when I go to direct a movie, I bring everyone who has ever been kind to me with me. Black, white, Asian, Spanish-speaking, Native American, gay, straight, everybody. I say, come with me. I'm going on the stage. Come with me. I need you now. Long dead. You see? So I don't ever feel I have no help. I've had rainbows in my clouds. And the thing to do, it seems to me, is to prepare yourself so that you can be a rainbow in somebody else's cloud. Somebody who may not look like you, may not call God the same name you call God, if they call God at all. You see? 
and may not eat the same dishes prepared the way you do, may not dance your dances or speak your language, but be a blessing to somebody. That's what I think. That poem resonates with me even stronger today than it did last year. Because I think about the rainbows and I think about the clouds that I experience on a daily basis. And I focus more on the rainbows now than I ever have. And I disregard or I at least try to look past some of the clouds. If I think about my career post the academy and post military, and if I were to put my resume on the screen with logos, it would look kind of like this. A lot of very large organizations that I worked for across 30 plus years, and I moved into a lot of different functional positions. I, uh, I was always in leadership roles, and I ran sales, marketing, um, large P&Ls. I eventually ended up on the C-suite running operations for the last organization that I was part of. But then I noticed that as I'm part of these organizations, just like in cycling, things would happen. I would get promoted or I'd get passed up for a promotion. I would have a conflict with my, with my boss or a conflict with someone who did not look like me, who worked for me. And I would attribute a lot of those conflicts to things that were outside of my control. They were like, in the cycling world, we call those headwinds. And the headwinds that you experience on a bicycle it actually zaps your energy. It makes you not want to ride anymore because no matter how much effort you're putting out, you're not moving forward at the pace that you should be for the amount of effort that you're putting into it. Those were like my clouds. And oftentimes I would pay a lot of attention to them and I would use them as the excuse for why things were turning out the way they were for me in life, especially during bad times. But then I remembered there were also these individuals in my life. And these individuals were kind of like the tailwind. And these individuals, I call them my angels, my allies, and my advocates. These were all the individuals who basically always had my back depending upon which organization I was part of. I owe them so much gratitude for looking at me as a person with potential and bringing the best out of me. They also reminded me of a lot of the kids that I went to high school with that called me names that were not my own. And so now I'm a little bit perplexed. How can I be angry with individuals who have actually created the life that I have come to learn to live and enjoy today? How can I put myself in a position where I begin to categorize people in a way that is negative and shut them out of my life? It just didn't make sense to me whatsoever. And then 2020 hit. 2020 was a period of time where I had to do a lot of soul searching. I was at like the precipice of my life, where I was thinking, all this work that I'm doing in corporate America, as good as it is, I feel like there's a different calling for what I should be doing. I know the work that I do in corporate America, but I feel called to do something else. I feel called to figure out a way of giving or living out the purpose that I believe I was, I was born to live out. And that's when I also entered the ALP and made that big decision to do this work outside of corporate America. And it hasn't been, and it still is not easy, but it is part of the journey that I am now on. I want to go back just for a second to the academy and tell you about my career there. Because you see, I, I fought for three and a half years on the national level. I was an All-American, a two-time national boxing champ. And I was, I had one of those records that <laughs> just it was really, really good. But there was one fight that I refused to go into. There was one fight that I forfeited. It was the only fight that I've ever 
in my entire career decided I am not going to take that, that match. It was a fight that I was sized up with a person who is a good friend of mine. He was my best friend, actually. He was in the same weight class, and we were supposed to fight. And I knew that he had no chance of winning this fight, but at the same time, I did not want to put our, our relationship at risk. So I forfeited the fight. Why does that fight remind me of the journey that I'm on right now? And how does that all come together? I didn't take that fight because I didn't want to risk my friendship. And so I did not live out my purpose. I did not give him the chance of even being in the ring with me. The road that I'm on right now feels the exact same way in that there are so many people who do the work that I do and politically, their ideologies are so different than mine. I don't feel the same about all the different ideologies that are being pushed out under the banner of DEI. I don't believe life is fair. I don't believe everybody will end up at the same place at the end of life. I don't believe that this thing that we call equity is that easy. I think it's elusive. As a matter of fact, I think there are certain people that are better prepared to do certain jobs than other people. It has nothing to do with skin tone or religious or even gender. It has more to do with just skill set and your background experiences. And so I struggle a lot of times with the work in this, in this spot in my life because I know if, I, if I'm true to myself, if I'm walking the path seeking truth myself, I end up upsetting people and potentially endangering my relationship with a community that, quite frankly, has embraced me as a fellow DEI instructor. And so I lean heavily on this group. I lean heavily on this organization because it feels more like home, more like a community to me. And every time I am in your presence, I learn something new about myself and also about you, which gives me courage to continue down this path not feeling like I'm by myself. My work here is all about bringing out the best in everyone, whatever that means. But at the same time, I do not want to fall victim to an ideology or a set of ideologies that I don't, quite frankly, think are going to be useful long term for any of us. So today, I welcome you to walk along with me on this path, because I think collectively it is going to be so much better done and executed than if any one of us tried to do this work by ourselves. Thank you.